Juicy co-creators, Lilu here on the Juicy Living Tour. Today I'm in wonderful, delicious, juicy Amsterdam with this beautiful sun with Pim van Lommel. Hello. Hello. <laughs> Good sitting with you here in, in the sunny Amsterdam. I've heard a lot about you, of course, with a lot of people and, and, and co-creators around the world that told me you have to interview this cardiologue, this Dutch cardiologue. He's amazing and he wrote these books and I wrote it and I love it. And please, you know, and you wrote consciousness beyond life uh, you published in the lancet which is a very well-known medical journal which year was that when you published the report in december 2001 it was published in the lancet uh -huh. our study and the exact study title was it was the this the near-death experience in survivors of cardiac arrest a prospective study in the netherlands uh -huh. Because that's what you are. You are a cardiologue, so you've studied that and you had a lot of patients and, and your patients were reporting those near-death experience. And so we're going to speak of near-death experience, of course, but you really brought some scientific proof to, to this whole equation. I would love to, before we get into the, the details and the scientific part, how did you... What is your perception on consciousness? Because I was describing to you right now, the, you know, the tour and what's happening around the world. And we were talking of, of really the maybe the evolution of human beings to what is happening. What is your feeling on all this? How do you define it? I don't give a definition of consciousness because it has so many aspects. But I, you can say that you by your consciousness you create your own subjective reality. And by your intention you can create the work you're doing. You create it yourself because of your, your, your consciousness. When you change your consciousness, you can change the world. That's what you are doing as well. And what's in a nutshell really how what our perception, our consciousness creates our reality. So if we're not open to any of this, then we'll have a fully, a total different experience of a whole situation, right? It's, it's quite, that's amazing. Yes, I would say when you're in love, the world is beautiful. When you're depressed, the world is all like hell. When you are a materialistic scientist, that is just matter, just external things, and you cannot measure consciousness, you cannot measure subjective experiences. So for those people, consciousness is just an illusion, while it's just the essence of who we are. Mm, let's get into that. Let's get into what happens when the heart stops. Yeah. Well, what we know as a cardiologist, as a medical, uh, as a physician, that we, we know that when the heart stops, people lose the consciousness within seconds. When you measure the blood flow to the brain, it's zero within one second. So there's no blood flow going to the brain. The clinical findings are that they lose their uh, body reflex. The body, it's just without functioning, and that's the function of the cortex of the brain. The brain stem reflexes are gone. The gag reflex, you can put a finger in someone's throat without problems. The cordial reflex, uh, widened pupils who don't react on light anymore, their brain stem reflexes are gone. The breathing is gone, because the breathing center is close to the brain stem. And then, uh, there have been studies done in humans and in animals models as well, to measure the electrical activity of the brain, the EEG. And we see that the EEG is an average after 15 seconds, it's a flat line. So the brain doesn't function at all clinically within seconds, but within 50 seconds, there's no electrical activity of the cortex anymore. The still never proven assumption is that consciousness is a product of brain function. So when patients have a cardiac arrest, when the brain doesn't function anymore after 10 to 15 seconds, it should not be possible that patients have conscious experience and memories because all those structures who underpin those kind of experiences don't function anymore because there's no blood flow to the brain. 
and that still there are people who survive cardiac arrest by resuscitation. Can How do you, uh, what resuscitation is like they were clinically dead? Yeah, a cardiac arrest is called clinical death because patients with a cardiac arrest due, due to acute myocardial infarction uh, are in the beginning of the phase of dying. And you have to start the resuscitation, defibrillation, external heart massage within five to ten sec uh, minutes. Otherwise, there is irreversible damage to the brain and people will die. So it's a kind of reversible period of the dying process. But the people are already dying. And in this process, where you resuscitate early and adequate, people can come back. Uh, but still a lot of people die as well of cardiac arrest. Uh, but then the, you can have the opportunity to hear patients tell about the NDE. But in my experience, when I didn't ask for it, hmm. I never heard it. So you have to be open as a doctor and ask for it, take time for it. Otherwise, people will be silent because even for themselves, it's an incredible experience beyond expectation. What triggered you then? You had heard of it, a book? Yeah. Well, no, the, the first time I ever heard about a near death experience was in 69, when I started my specialization as a cardiologist. And the coronary carriers were just so new. So before 45 years ago, 67, it was not possible to resuscitate patients. All patients with cardiac arrest died. We, we just forget it, 45 years ago. Mm -hmm. But this was one of the first coronary care units in Holland. And we resuscitated, resuscitated the patient with a cardiac arrest. And after about four minutes, he regained consciousness after several defibrillations. And we as a resuscitation team, I was the doctor in charge. We were so happy that it, it was all new, that we succeeded. Mm -hmm. But the patient was extremely disappointed that he was back in his body. And he told me about a light, beautiful music, beautiful landscape. And I always say, I never forgot this event, but it didn't do anything with it. Until in 1986, I read a book by George Ritchie, Return from Tomorrow, where he describes his near-death experience that he had as a medical student in '43 when he died of a double pneumonia, and there were no antibiotics available at that time so easily. So he died. He was covered by a sheet, his body, and a nurse was couldn't accept that his medical student died. So he, he persuaded a, a doctor in charge to give him an injection right into his heart from adrenaline, which was quite uncommon. But he regained consciousness after nine minutes, and then he had an extensive near death experience, very impressive. And later also he told it on university as a doctor, and one of the medical students was Raymond Moody who started to study this, and he invented the terminology near-death experience, and he wrote this book, Life After Life in 75. But I didn't know it, I didn't read it. And I didn't know at that time, in 69 also, I didn't know that this kind of experience has always been mentioned in all times, all cultures, all religions. So it was not new at all, but it was new for me. Yeah. So later on, you start doing your own study, and you discover that about 18, 19, 20 percent uh, of people that have this uh, heart, you know, that stops, that have this and come back, have had had this near-death experience. What do they have? Tell us about that study, how you put it together, what does it prove? Yeah. How does it change the whole landscape, actually, of science? Yeah. Well, there are a lot of questions. Yes. <laughs> Let's start As usual, I'm kind of like <laughs> bubbling because it's so exciting, isn't it? I mean, how exciting is this to be sitting with a cardiologue and having these type of conversation? My goodness, times are changing. <laughs> well, for me, it was new as well. So when I had read this book by George Ritchie, I just started to ask my patients who survived the cardiac arrest in the past if they could remember something from the period of unconsciousness. And to my big surprise, Within two years, 12 out of 50 patients told me about their death, their death experience. So then my scientific curiosity started to grow. It's a lot of noise now here. Yeah, we have a beautiful plane uh, over us. We might quite not hear it. And we also have the bells huh, yeah, in yeah, the background. They are beautiful. Wester yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Beautiful church. Yeah. Um, so then 
my scientific curiosity started to grow because as a medical student and as a doctor I had always learned in the university that consciousness is a product of brain function. So it is impossible according to this uh, theory that people could have consciousness that alone enhance consciousness during cardiac arrest. And there have been uh, some retrospective studies and people have said well this is just just the result of anoxia of the brain, lack of oxygen in the brain, or neurotransmitters, or hallucinations, or side effect of drugs, or uh, fear of death, or just uh, false memories or whatever. But there has never been a real scientific study done. So we started in '88 a prospective study of 344 consecutive patients who survived cardiac arrest in 10 Dutch hospitals to look if we could find an explanation for the cause and content of the NDE. And we just had patients with cardiac arrest because they are clinical death. They are in the phase of dying. So it is a very strict medical life-threatening condition. And we know if you don't resusc resuscitate a patient, they will all die. And we know also these patients have no brain functions at all after 15 seconds. Yeah. And how they can still memorize? How could they still remember that they had these experiences? Like, where is it? Where is this memory from coming from? Is located? Yeah. <laughs> well, according to current medical science, everything is located in the brain. Yeah. It's localized in the brain. So it shouldn't be possible. So we have to discuss again this never proven assumption that consciousness is a product of brain function because the brain doesn't function anymore in patients with who are clinical death. So the only way to explain it is the theory of continuity or the mm. uh, that is that the consciousness is over there there's no beginning of end to consciousness and the brain has just a function as a transceiver transmitter receiver or interface it has a facilitating function it makes it possible to experience waking consciousness in our body in our brain but real then non-local consciousness, which is consciousness without time, without space, in another higher realm, is always there, without beginning and end, and we just receive a, just a small part of it. And this having this kind of experiences is not only happening with cardiac arrest, but the brain function is, is really uh, not there anymore, but also uh, another critical uh, situation, like, like that children near drowning can have the same experiences. Mm -hmm. uh, or women, uh, complications in childbirth, a lot of, lot of breast, blood, but also in isolation or meditation or depression or existential crisis, but the brain function is normal. They can have the same kind of experiences. So that also what we found in our study as a result, that there is no psychological explanation like fear of death, no pharmacological explanation like side effect of drugs, and no physiological explanation like the uh, lack of oxygen in the brain. Because only 80% of those patients had a near-death experience, and all patients had an oxy of the brain, lack of oxygen in the brain because of the cardiac arrest. They all had been unconscious. Beyond their beliefs, and also beyond their religion, beyond their status, beyond their comprehension, their studies, all of that. So, children have the same experiences as adults, and Christians have the same experience as atheists. But they still try to f find words for this ineffable experience, and this. So they try to interpret and formalize this kind of experience by their own background, by their own religion, by their own culture. So children will use different words as adults, but will try to tell you the same aspects of elements of the NDE. And an atheist will find different words than a Christian or a Hindu or a Buddhist. But they try to find words for this ineffable uh, uh, experience. Timeless, no space, pure love or light yeah. beyond God. Yeah, that, so there are uh, quite a lot of elements and the first thing that people tell us that the pain has gone the pain of the traffic accident the pain of the, the heart attack they don't feel the body anymore and they have the feeling this is dead I am dead now and then they can have the possibility of a uh, perception from a position out and above the body they can see their own resuscitation from above or their own operation from above they can see theoretical details which you can corroborate later 
that it can come into a dark space, which can be frightening for about 15%. They see a small point of light where they're attracted to, where they mostly describe it as a tunnel. And through this tunnel, they come in an otherworldly dimension without beautiful colors, beautiful landscapes, beautiful music. And they mostly see a being of light, of light and light, and there's this unconditional love, wisdom. You know all the answers before asking the questions. And mostly in this being of life with incredible acceptance and the feeling of love is something we don't know here. It's far more, far beyond what we know from love here. Is it something they report right after when you get in the room and you start talking to them? Or does it take a while before they even know that they're back in this body? Is there a time lapse like that? Because now near-death experiences are more and more shared. I mean, this is I'm wondering even how it's evolving through time, like from the first stories that you got to now where, where a lot of people are sharing their own. So there's probably some more common elements these days, or is it really the same core experience? Yeah. But it's the same kind of experience. They also have made a study, Bruce Grace in the United States has made a study from uh, reports of NDEs before 75, before the book Life After Life and after 75. They still report the same elements. Uh, Plato has written 2,000 years ago about the soldier Ur who had a near death. He had told the same kind of elements with, with the words from that time. So it, it's the same kind of elements always. And, and in this light or the being of light, they can see the life review, but this means you relive the whole life. Each thought you ever had is kept with the influence on others. I always say, think about it, that each thought you ever had, each intent you ever have is kept. And you are connected with everything what you thought or did or said in the past. And you are connected with the feeling and emotions of others as well. So it's an interconnectedness. Someone said, as if I was seeing with all seeing eyes, I, I, I felt everything. And then sometimes they can see also future events from personal life, which is incredible. Someone said, I have written it down, I could skip them off during the years, because it all happened. Uh, then they sometimes come to a border, and they know if I cross this border, I will never come back. And then sometimes it's in the communication, like uh, it isn't your time yet, or if you have to fulfill. You have to do something still in, 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 in life. And then they come back into the body, which is awful, because you feel again the, the, the pain of, of, and, and the restriction of your disease. So coming back is awful for them. That's the reason they are so disappointed to be back as well. And talking about it is also a huge problem, because doctors don't believe it. No. Sisters don't believe it. They say, oh, it's just hallucination. It's just side effect of rest. Tomorrow it's over. Here, you get some, some medication, etc. You meet doctors, huh? You have met doctors, I guess. You have, d d you went to some kind of reunions with some materialist. Yeah. Well, the first for me, Sal, I never heard about the death experience because they didn't ask for it. Yeah. So you have to ask for it, you have to be open because so s they're so reluctant to, to talk about it. And I know about a conference about the death experience in a university hospital with more than 300 people in attendance, and they were were lectures about NDE, and at the end one man stood up and said, I'm a cardiologist for more than 25 years. I've never heard such absurd stories, this total nonsense, and don't believe one word for it. Then another man stood up and said, I'm one of your patients. I had a death experience, you should be the last one I would ever tell. They feel and know that these kind of doctors are not open to listen. So they, they're silent. So these kind of doctors will never hear about it. How do you deal with that? Because this is, I feel, this is, I mean, I know this is something we all face to some degrees. You have this uh, scientific understanding and you have those, those, those stories that came to you. I mean, how, how do you deal with that, this, this kind of reactions of, of, of your colleagues, of peers? How do you deal with it and how do you bring it into reality? I guess part of you wants to really <laughs> make it uh, tangible for them. <laughs> I never try to convince people, yeah. never. Uh, if they don't believe that they have a problem. Yeah. I don't, I will never try to convince them. I have the facts, I have our findings, I have my, uh, let's say, my, my theories about how I could explain this kind of experience with the approach of, of non-locality of consciousness, the brain just being a 
facilitator, not a producer of consciousness. And I lecture a lot also for medical students. I lecture a lot in hospitals, hospices, and there's still a lot of people, more were getting open, but there's still be a lot of physicians who are not open, don't want to be open. I always say it's prejudice and willful ignorance. Because if it would be true what I am telling them, the whole world view would collapse. And they don't want it. And I accept it. I don't want them to be frightened because of the, the, the world view they have. So, uh, Time. You continue. You you do your lectures because I know you travel a lot and you just came back from Brussels. I lectured uh, all over the world. Yeah. I got even to it. It's always sold out. It's it's it's, mm -hmm. and a lot of people just are so open for it now. And and I'm so I'm very positive. It's changing. The the, and there are more and more people who can tell us about it. That because of the modern techniques of resuscitation, more and more people will survive cardiac arrest. Will survive critical medical situations. But also more and more people are doing meditation or mindfulness and, and will change also their own state of consciousness as well. More and more people are willing to share this intuitive sensitivity with others. So openness helps. But it's still a problem in the Western world to talk about these kind of experiences because people are not open for it. Let's talk of neuroplasticity, yeah. DNA. Yeah. The junk DNA, what, what scientists call junk DNA, uh, and and quantum physics. How are those? You know, what are, what are some of the openings, insights that you had regarding those? Yeah. Let's first start with neuroplasticity. Yeah. Um, if there is uh, non-local consciousness, that means that everything is connected without time, without space. And uh, people with the intuitive, uh, intuitive sensitivity still have this feeling to be connected with other people, connected with our endangered planet, connected with animals, with plants, etc. They're just interconnected because their threshold for consciousness has been changed. Their, their reception ability has been enhanced. So we receive information from others. It's the non-local information exchange, as we call it. They receive information not by the senses, not by their body. And we know now that this consciousness can also change matter or structures. So we can change also our brain function, what is, which is neuroplasticity. When we do meditation, or the structure and our function of our brain will change. And we can measure it with EEG of fMRI of PET scan. We can see the permanent changes in the brain in people who do long-term meditation. We also see changes in the brain when they do just meditation for three or six weeks. We see changes in the brain with mindfulness training. We see changes in the brain with placebo, where people believe that they get medication for, let's say, chronic pain patients or depression patients or patients with Parkinson's disease. They improve by just having the idea that they get medication. And you see the changes in the brain by PET scan and fMRI as well. You see more, with Parkinson's patients, you see more dopamine in the brain. It there comes dopamine because they believe that they receive medication. So changes in consciousness brings changes in the body and the brain. And then you also come to the, to the body as a whole. I believe that DNA has also an interface function or reception function another beautiful plane Woo. <laughs> we can definitely hear it because this is a unidirectional mic so yeah we can so uh, we know from dna that 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 four percent has a function and 96 percent is called junk dna because we don't know what it is and i don't believe that nature will make any junk so it must have a, junk, uh, a function we don't know yet. And I think this junk DNA has a reception ability. It also is receiving information from this non-local realm. And it can be morphogenetic information, it can be love, it can be what we call unconscious, subconscious information. Uh, if you realize that when a new creature is born, created by the egg cell and the spermatozoa, then there is a new DNA, a specific person, specific DNA in the world. And when there have been four cell divisions, 
cells are changing into heart cells, nerve cells, skin cells, eye, whatever. The structure of the DNA in all the cells is the same, but the function is changing. We have about more than 100 different functions of cells in our body. The structure is, cha is the same. So what makes the function of the DNA change? This is information from outside. This is not local information. So we receive this kind of morphogenetic information, whatever you would call it, morphogenetic uh, consciousness, into our body. Uh, so, so DNA, for me, and also we know from epigenetics that the structure for the DNA is the same, but the function will change because of information we receive from outside. So, and, and it's also genetic. So when you got information from your grandparents, your children will have it as well. So this information from outside comes into a change in, in function of the DNA. So the surroundings are also very important. And then you ask me about quantum physics. Well, the observer, yeah, yeah. which we kind of started this, this conversation at the beginning of this interview with. Exactly. Well, the, the quantum physics has changed our world view. It has taken 60 to 80 years before it was accepted. Because until that time, the last centuries, there has been the Newtonian physics, but is everything is local, causal, local, etc. And with quantum physics, there's no matter anymore. Matter is emptiness, and matter is 99.999% vacuum. And this vacuum is filled with energy and information. It's a totally different view. And what we know from quantum physics is that the consciousness of the of the scientist defines the result of the experiments. So we can prove that si light behaves as particles, and we can prove that light behaves as waves. Both is true, but it cannot be both true. It's complementary. So the consciousness of the experiment causes the result. Which, so we can ask, how is objective science possible when the subjective aspects, the conscious of the experiment, is so important. So I think we, we, we lost the idea that science can be objective. And also the problem with that, with the old-fashioned materialist science, is that the only thing that, that exists is what we can measure, what we can duplicate, what we can reproduce. And then they have a problem with consciousness. We cannot prove Consciousness. We cannot measure consciousness. We cannot prove what somebody feels or thinks. We cannot scientifically prove that someone is in love or is. So, the problem with consciousness, we cannot prove it. So, uh, we have to change our definition of, of, of science. We have mm. to include subjective experiences as well. The first person experience is also important, not only our physical world. It's more than that. We are more than our physical beings. I always say, we have a body, but we are conscious. We are conscious, and, and 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 death is just the end of our physical aspects. Without a body, we have still can have conscious experience. We still are conscious beings without a body, and that's what we have learned from studies from NDEs. Uh, we do you do you see with your travel you have received a lifetime award uh, life achievement award in India and New Delhi you travel all around I do too on the juicy tour I feel this is happening all over the place yeah. all all <laughs> different countries you know all backgrounds people are are you excited about these times is it really happening or do you think we're actually thinking it's it's happening but not really because that's what we so much want to see what is your perception on that I, i'm very positive i think i think the last 10 years or five years people are more and more getting open and also my book was which was published in 2008 no and 2007 it it, it this was translated into English, but when it was mm -hmm. in, in Holland, it was a bestseller. Mm -hmm. It was nominated for the Book of the Year 2008 about this subject. Mm -hmm. So it, it was incredible what happens. And it's also a bestseller in Germany. So people are more and more open. And they want to read about it. And they want to listen. And they want to 
know more about it. So it, it's, especially the young people are very positive. But when I lecture to medical students, they're far more open than the, the physicians of my age. Mm, beautiful. <laughs> is there something else that is important in this conversation for you to express and say, knowing that this really reaches people all around the world and people are looking for this type of inspiration, you represent for them as you know a, a big piece of this puzzle? Well, I think the main thing is that we have this subjective experience which we cannot prove, but we can have the objective parts of this experience. It's one is that we did in our prospective study, our longitudinal study, to see if the transformation, the change of life inside, the loss of the fear of death and enhanced intuitive sensitivity is a result of the cardiac arrest or as a result of the NDE. What we found, it's only the result of the NDE. So the transformation is the result of the NDE. Also in children, we see the same transformation. Now Because the th they're alive. They, they are also, they're t when they are under the age of four, most children don't remember the content of the NDE, but they all have the transformation. They are highly intuitive, highly intelligent. So they're totally different than other children. I have uh, written a whole chapter about it. But the other thing is that people ask me, how can we prove that this kind of NDE happens during cardiac arrest? Why not in the first or last seconds? Then you have the f corroboration of theoretical aspects of the out-of-body experiences, which is important, uh, like the case of the Dutchess, what we call it, published in the Lancet. There was an, in a Dutch hospital, a 44 years old man was brought into hospital, into coma, he was found in coma, uh, somewhere in, in the city and the people didn't start adequate resuscitation. When they, so when he was brought to the hospital he was cyanotic, his body was already a little bit cold, was in deep coma, mm -hmm. no breathing, no heartbeat, no blood pressure uh, and the nurse who was in charge was trying to intubate the patient to give him more, more oxygen and they found out that the patient had dentures in the mouth so he took out his dentures and put them somewhere on the crash card and they needed one and a half hour of resuscitation before they had a blood pressure and, and, and uh, heart rhythm again. Because he was young, they tried a long time. But then he still was in coma, he still needed artificial respiration, was still intubated. So he, he was transferred to the intensive care unit for artificial respiration, where he was another one week in coma. And when he regained consciousness, he was ref transferred back to the cardiac ward. And he was just there when a nurse came in. He saw the nurse and said, you know where my dentures are. <laughs> and, and he recognized the nurse and he could tell exactly the nurse where he had put his dentures, somewhere underneath a sliding drawer in, in the crash card. He couldn't describe the resuscitation room where he was brought into in coma, where he was transferred outside in coma. He could uh, describe it correctly from a position out and above his own body. He could see his own resuscitation, who could recognize the experience appears as like the, the nurses and the doctors who were involved in the CPR. So this is a kind of corroboration of theoretical aspects. And uh, recently uh, a study was published by Jenna Holden where she had found about 100 cases of corroboration of theoretical perceptions. And 90% of these perceptions were totally 100% true. 8% had a small error and only 2% were false, which means what they have seen, what they have perceived, was really there. And then the, it is by definition no hallucination, no illusion, no delusion, because it really happens what they saw. It's so important. Mm -hmm. Other aspects is that I know a story of a man who saw deceased relatives in his near death experience, like his deceased grandmother, and a man he didn't know. But he looked at him, this man looked at him lovingly, but he didn't know who it was. And uh, uh, ten years later, at the deathbed of his mother, she confessed to him that he was born out of an ex relationship. His father being a Jewish man who was murdered in the Second World War. And she showed him a picture. And the man he had seen ten years before in the death experience happened to be his biological father. Well, this is a kind of objective proof that what he really saw 10 years before was his biological father. He didn't know there was one. Eben Alexander and Dr. Eben Alexander had something similar with his sister. Huh? Exactly, exactly. It's the same. So if you haven't seen that interview, by the way, please go and check it out. Dr. Eben Alexander, wonderful book on the proof of heaven. It's a wonderful book, yes.
So uh, this, these kind of aspects are important for the people who are still reluctant to believe that these things can happen. And uh, when I started, I was reluctant to believe it as well. Yeah. But uh, my s uh, scientific curiosity changed into a kind of inner knowing that this is the only truth there is. The, it's all about consciousness. It's all about co and, and the, our physical aspects is just a temporary aspects of where we are, but we are consciousness. Would you say that now, these days, your heart is more open than, than ever? Would you, did you, is, there, is there also a correlation between the heart and the openness of the heart and consciousness and living and being open and receiving and sharing and living really a just juicy life? Yeah. I think we, we always try to, to connect our heart also with other aspects of consciousness or with love or whatever. And that's a kind of old-fashioned way of thinking. I think a whole body is a receiver as well. But perhaps our heart receives more aspects like love, but I don't know. Mm -hmm. But... I'm far more open for it, and I, I, people are open to me as well, I, I, and I resonate with them when they tell these very impressive emotional stories about Andy, and the, the trauma it is for them to have it in this Western world. It's just a positive experience, extremely positive, but it's a trauma to have it because you cannot share it with others. People won't believe it. Uh, more than 50% gets a divorce because they say, it's not the same partner I was married with. Uh, mm. Doctors don't believe you. Family friends don't believe you. And you're so it's years and years of, of depression, homesickness, and, and, and loneliness. So it's not that easy at all to have this kind of experiences. Mm -hmm. It's get shut down from that experience. It, it's high, I know patients who have been silent for more than 50 years. Mm. They didn't tell at all about this kind of experience. Mm. So that happens as well. Mm. Well, thank you so much. I'm really excited, my delicious co-creators. If you haven't read Conscious Beyond Life, there's many al also reports and documentaries on you on the internet. There's yeah. You're really, really active. Thank you for all the work that you've been doing and, and coming and meeting me here in Amsterdam. I so appreciate after giving a conference yesterday in Brussels. It really shows how committed you are and still are so committed. Thank you, Pim. You're welcome. You're welcome. Your job is also very important. You're, you help people that it's possible to be open, to get more open. So that's important. Thank you. And to you, all my beautiful, juicy co-creators around the world, thank you for watching this beautiful interview and sharing it with your friends and family and loved ones. I send you much, much love. Thank you for your support. Big kisses. Mwah. and he wrote these books and I wrote it and I love it and please, you know, and you wrote Consciousness Beyond Life. Uh, you published in The Lancet, which is a very well-known medical journal. Which year was that when you published the report? In December 2001, it was published in The Lancet, uh -huh. our study. And the exact study title was? That was the, the near-death experience in survivors of cardiac arrest, a prospective study in the Netherlands. Uh -huh. Because that's what you are. You are a cardiologue, so you've studied that and you had a lot of patients and, and your patients were reporting those near-death experience. And so we're going to speak of near-death experience, of course, but you really brought some scientific proof 
to to this whole equation. I would love to before we get into the the details and the scientific part. How did you? What is your perception on consciousness? Because I was describing to you right now, the, you know, the tour and what's happening around the world, and we were talking of of really the maybe the evolution of human beings too. What is happening? What is your feeling on all this? How do you define it? I don't give a definition of consciousness because it has so many aspects. But I, you can say that you, by your consciousness, you create your own subjective reality, and by your intention, you can create the work you're doing. You create it yourself because of your, your your consciousness. When you change your consciousness, you can change the world. That's what you are doing as well. And what's in a nutshell, really, how what our perception, our consciousness creates our reality. So if we're not open to any of this, then we'll have a fully, a total different experience of a whole situation. Right? It's it's quite. That's amazing. Yes, I would say when you're in love, the world is beautiful. When you're depressed, the world is all like hell. When you are a materialistic scientist, that is just matter, just external things. Hello my juicy co-creators, Lilu here on the Juicy Living Tour. Today I'm in wonderful, delicious, juicy Amsterdam with this beautiful son with Pim van Lommel. Hello. Hello. <laughs> Good sitting with you here in, in the sunny Amsterdam. I've heard a lot about you, of course, with a lot of people and, and, and co-creators around the world that told me you have to interview this cardiologue, this Dutch cardiologue. He's a and reflexes are gone. The breathing is gone because the breathing center is close to the brainstem. And then uh, there have been studies done in humans and in animals models as well to measure the electrical activity of the brain, the EEG. And we see that the EEG is an average after 15 seconds, it's a flat line. So the brain doesn't function at all clinically within seconds, but within 50 seconds, there's no electrical activity of the cortex anymore. The still never proven assumption is that consciousness is a product of brain function. So when patients have a cardiac arrest, when the brain doesn't function anymore after 10 to 15 seconds, it shouldn't be possible that patients have conscious experience and memories. Because all those structures who underpin those kinds of experience don't function anymore because there's no blood flow to the brain. And then still there are people who survive and you cannot measure Consciousness, you cannot measure subjective experiences. So, for those people, consciousness is just an illusion, while it's just the essence of who we are. Mm, let's get into that. Let's get into what happens when the heart stops. Yeah. Well, what we know as a cardiologist, as a medical, uh, as a physician, that we, we know that when the heart stops, people lose the consciousness within seconds. When you measure the blood flow to the brain, it's zero within one second. So there's no blood flow going to the brain. The clinical findings are that they lose their uh, body reflexes. The body, it's just without functioning. And that's a function of the cortex of the brain. The brain stem reflexes are gone. The gag reflex, you can put a finger in someone's throat without problems. The cordial reflex, uh, widened pupils who don't react on light anymore, they're brain 